Good evening, everybody. Can, can you hear me in the back? Am I, am I too loud? Okay, good. Well, great. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to 2019 Brain School. For those of you who have not been involved with this before, I just want to remind you, this is part of a national and an international event that's been going on for quite a while now. I actually don't know how many years, I've forgotten, but a while, uh, which is called Brain Awareness Week. And Brain Awareness Week was started by the Dana Brain Alliance, now called the Dana Foundation, uh, which I've been a member for a long time. <clears throat> and it was, the idea was to bring that to the public in terms of that being information about the brain, learning about our own brains, what's new, what's exciting in brain research, what are some things uh, we can learn from the past, and becoming more aware of brains and how important they are. From a strictly medical point of view, many of you have heard me say this before, but I'll just reiterate it, uh, as it turns out, things that affect our brains and make them not work as well as we would hope they might account for more medical costs, more people affected, and more days lost from work than all the other disorders combined. That's all cancers, all heart disease. So brains are uh, obviously important for a lot of reasons, but not the least of which when things go wrong, it has an enormous impact on society, both in the United States and worldwide. So it's a very important issue in contemporary biomedicine. And secondly, brains are just really cool. I mean, just think about it, like the old you know, Wizard of Oz. What would you be without a brain? Everybody wants a brain. Sure, hearts are important. Livers are good. Kidneys, okay. Brains are fantastic. I mean, think about all the stuff that brains do. Poetry. Okay, building, architecture, economics, politics. All right, well, certain brains think one way and certain think another. But nonetheless, brains are really important machines. And it would be really good if we understood how they work and we're constantly learning about them. So there are a lot of gee whiz factoids to share over the week. The way we've structured this particular <coughs> uh, brain school in 2019 is shown here. If you can read it, I realize it's pretty small, but today's uh, an opening day, an introduction. Myself and Dr. Audrey Van Wart will each give 25, 30 minute uh, talks about some exciting things across the animal kingdom and brains. And then as the week goes on uh, through Tuesday and uh, Wednesday and Thursday, uh, each time, each evening, you'll have two people again giving the presentations. And in those cases, one person will be what we call a, a basic scientist, somebody who's doing research on some aspect of brain function, and then a clinician uh, working in the clinic, obviously, and something related to that. And they'll take on additional topics that are listed here. So we have a little bit of a potpourri. There's not one single theme, really, uh, throughout. But you'll be hearing about, as I said tonight, some really exciting examples of how different brains in the animal kingdom work. Uh, and then tomorrow night about rhythms uh, related to sleep and, and uh, things that affect our circadian rhythms in the brain. And then on Wednesday, uh, you'll be hearing about brain injuries and uh, some research going on with animal models and what's happening in the clinic. And then finally on Thursday, you'll hear about the aging brain, uh, both the science of exciting things about brain aging and dementia, and again, from a clinical perspective, what's being done there. So hopefully you'll pick up a number of things that everybody will find something of interest to them through the course of the week. A couple of quick announcements. Um, for those of you who attend all week, you will get a graduation certificate at the end of the week. We're watching and taking attendance. So you can't slip in a look-alike or something like that. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, today and Wednesday, immediately after the lectures, we'll have that all-popular brain in a bucket demonstration out in the lobby, where we'll have a series of human brains in buckets for you to play with, handle, look at, and learn from our own Dr. Mike Fox in the back of the room. Mike, you want to wave to the audience so they recognize you? He'll be out there again. That's just today and Wednesday evening, so we won't be able to have that every night. Uh, and then tomorrow evening, after the lectures, we'll have one of our students demonstrating a, a kind of a virtual reality display of walking through a brain and seeing how the cells are connected. And then on Thursday evening, we'll have a presentation from a community group on Alzheimer's disease out in the lobby uh, as well. So in each case, there'll be uh, presentations here as part of Brain School and then something after out in the lobby. And of course, we always have the reception beforehand. So that's the plan for the week. So let's get started because I know time is tight. So uh, as I already said, this is sponsored by the Dana Brain Alliance and also the Society for Neuroscience uh, as well. So let's start this evening by thinking about some of the critters I'd like to tell you about their brains. Some people have asked me whether they actually have brains. The answer is yes, all critters have brains. And so tonight we're going to focus on this one, uh, a rattlesnake, your friendly uh, western rattlesnake. This one called an electric fish, but it may be a little different than electric fish most of you know of. This is a so-called weakly versus a strongly electric fish. 
this one called a barn owl, and this one called a child, which happens to be one of our grandchildren as well. Uh, his name is Yates, and this is not his brain, but it is a human brain. And being a scientist, you can only get away with so much with your family, you know how it is. But these are, these, this is a brain of a rattlesnake, this is a brain of a weakly electric fish, and this is a brain of an owl, and a brain of a human. And it turns out they have specializations and differences, but they also have a lot of things of, in common as well. And we're going to point out some of the specialties tonight. That's what tonight's uh, presentation by me is about. So I start out with this quote, quote by Algius Huxley, who said, there are things known and then there are things unknown, and in between are the doors of perception. So perception, I think we all think of as things that happen all the time. For all of us, we perceive that somebody has insulted us. We perceive that the room is warm. We perceive we hear a sound. These things are called perceptions, of course, and they're carried into our brain by what we call sensory systems or sensory apparatus. And one person's perception may be very different than another. A particular color may cause you to respond a different way than I respond to it, a particular sound, a fragrance. I think you're all familiar with the concept of having a fragrance have an emotional attachment to it. Uh, you may remember from your early childhood a particular pleasant smell associated with good memories, and then you smell that again and the whole memory comes flooding forward, or, or the opposite, of course, a particular smell associated with a bad memory. So that tells you how that system is very tightly tied to circuits in the brain re related to emotion and memory, for example. So we're going to take a look at some of these, and let's just start with a, a, a kind of an introductory science slide on the energy spectrum. So I realize it's a little small, but I'll tell you what you're looking at here is a plot of the electromagnetic spectrum going from very powerful short wavelength type of en energy, and on this end you see gamma rays, which I'm sure you've all heard of, and you don't want to get exposed to a lot of gamma rays if you don't have to, uh, going up through X-rays, and then we're in the blue or ultraviolet part of the spectrum, and then going into the red part of the spectrum, what's called infrared, and then eventually radio waves, and these are big distances. So the way these are measured is by the wavelength, the distance between two peaks on an oscillating sine wave, and this is the electromagnetic spectrum. Right in here, squished in the middle with the little colors on it, like the rainbow, are shown what we call the visible spectrum. That's our world for our eye as humans. We can see because of the nature of molecules in our eye and how those are in cells that connect to other cells that go into our brain, only a certain part of the electromagnetic spectrum that's out there. It doesn't mean the rest isn't out there. It's all around us all the time. We just cannot sense it, nor can we perceive it, because we don't have the right apparatus. But there are other species who can, and they operate in different ranges of this particular spectrum. So for example, <clears throat> this infrared part of the spectrum, showing here a mouse, here's a, a cat, I think, here's a human, and here's a uh, faraway shot of several humans taking with infrared thermography. And I think you can see, using that part of the spectrum, you can actually see a lot. In fact, engineers in our military use this to their advantage, to use infrared imaging to see heat coming from radiant sources in the dark. Well, in nature, several animals can do this biologically. And by the way, this is a now famous or infamous picture some of you may remember uh, at the Boston Marathon, the tragic bombing that happened there, and the ge gentleman and his brother that were chased for a period of time, and they finally found him hiding in this boat. There's a picture of his body, quite alive, image with infrared imaging. So they could detect his body heat through the boat. That's how he was found. So you can see how this technology can be used in police work and for the military and a lot of other things as well. However, a lot of animals can do this. So everybody's friend, the bed bug, for example. Bed bugs turn out to have the ability to sense infrared heat. That's how they find you in the bed when they come crawling out from under that nasty mattress or box springs in the hotel room. You're warm compared to the environment. This is a mosquito. Mosquitoes use both carbon dioxide and infrared detection to find you and bite you. So your CO2 that you expire through normal respiration, they can detect that, but they also can detect the heat on your skin surface to find where to plunge their proboscis and have a blood meal. And these are just some pictures taken of what you would look like the bed bugs, by the, by the way, in case you're interested. So I'm now going to show you a critter that has a natural infrared detection system. And I selected these videos carefully, so I hope nobody gets too upset. Nothing is killed in this picture. But you will see a strike by a rattlesnake in the dark. 
And this rattlesnake has an infrared detection system on board. And you're going to see a little animal called a kangaroo rat co jumping by twice. And you'll see what the rattlesnake does in the dark. Missed him. <laughs> Where do you see this next acrobatic move? Look how this snake has his mouth open to try to catch him when he comes down. <laughs> but he misses. <clears throat> so the way, that, the way that rattlesnake could do that is because it has special organs in the face called pits that enable them to detect the infrared heat, to actually see, as you will, through your eyes, through his infrared detection system. So let me teach you a little more or share with you a little more about that. So this is a picture of the rattlesnake's face. As it turns out, other snakes like pythons and boas shown here and here, also have the ability to detect infrared radiation. But the rattlesnakes are particularly good at this. This, of course, is a rattlesnake's face, its eye with the pupil, here's its nostril. And here is this pit called a heat sensing pit. This is what it uses to collect the information and precisely localize where a warm target is in the dark. This is a blow up drawing of the pit. And it has a little opening here. And various parts of membranes around it. Well, you can't see very well these little squiggly lines. This is a nerve. This is called the trigeminal nerve. We have a trigeminal nerve in our face that innervates our face. And as a matter of fact, if you were to close your eyes and do this experiment right and have somebody next to you gently move their hand near your face, very close, slow enough you don't feel the wind from it because that would be cheating, but you would probably be able to detect the warmth from their hand. In other words, your trigeminal nerve in your face can do what the snakes does, but nowhere near as well or as sensitive. The snake can do it at a great distance and very precisely. And it's because of this pit that acts like a little parabolic reflector, almost creating an eye, if you will, but for the energy in the infrared part of the spectrum shown here. And so it can actually, as shown in this picture, localize the position of different infrared sources. It doesn't just know there's something warm out there, it knows there's something warm out there at 33 degrees left, or 18 degrees right, and 2 degrees elevation, which means as it coils and loads, it can strike to that point, calculating based on the azimuth <coughs> and the elevation. And how does, how does it do that? Well, these are some real, real data taken from rattlesnakes, for example, here, to show a molecule that's in there. The particular molecule that is sitting, a protein, inside this pit is called a trip channel. And that's a particular type of a protein that we have in our brains that is particularly sensitive to certain signals. In humans, it's particularly sensitive to chemical irritants. You've all heard of wasabi, for example. So wasabi will actually, actually activate this on nerve endings in your mouth to create that irritating, painful sensation. In the snake, the same molecule, as it turns out, is located in the pits and can detect infrared radiation as well. So there was a debate for quite a while. Did the rattlesnake see infrared the way our eyes see? In other words, did it have a molecule in its pit called uh, a visual pigment that could detect light? Or did it have another kind of a protein that could detect warmth? And we now know the answer from this work of uh, Dr. Julius at University of California, San Francisco, who discovered that they do indeed have this same protein in these pits in their face. Now, if this protein was going to work and do its job, it would have to be sensitive to temperature changes in a certain range where our body temperature would be. So what they did in this experiment, very ingeniously, I think, is they took the DNA that codes for the molecule inside the pit in the snake's face and they put that into some other kinds of cells to grow them in a dish in cell culture. They're called hex cells. And then they put inside those cells an agent that would allow them to see if the cells were excited or not. It's called a, something called a calcium imaging agent. And the colors show you how excited they got, how much calcium is in them when they're exposed to these different temperatures here. And you can see these cells responding from the rattlesnake here lighting up in this temperature range between 32 and 40 degrees centigrade. This is actually the wasabi derivative right here that also activates them. So this proved for the first time that the molecule had been discovered within the pit of a rattlesnake to confer 
infrared sensitivity. And it's innervated by that trigeminal nerve in the face that then goes into the brain to convey that information. So I'm now going to show you a little, another short clip of how the snake responds to the infrared heat. And this snake, I should point out, and I think most of the video, if not all, has uh, little covers over his eyes. So he can't be using his eyes. He can only be using the infrared sense. This is a warm rod being held in front of the snake. He actually missed on that one. It wasn't that good. There's his eyes covered, as you can see. He's okay. He just has little band-aids over his eyes. And so that rod you saw is warm, warmer than the environment, generating infrared energy. And the snake responds with a fairly precise strike. So how does this happen in the brain? Well, here's a drawing of the snake's head with his brain embedded here. This is the spinal cord. This is the front part of the brain, has various names. Uh, and this is what's called the pit organ right here. And this nerve here is the trigeminal nerve that I talked about earlier. And it goes into a part of the brain stem called the nucleus of the lateral descending trigeminal tract. It's a very specialized area in the rattlesnake brain. It then makes connections, there's synapses with the nerve cells there, and they then project up into this region called the optic tectum. Now we have an optic tectum. It has a different name. In human beings, it's called the superior colliculus. But it's basically the same thing in terms of the history and evolution of the vertebrate brain. And here's a little more colorful picture, the optic nerve going to this nucleus. And then it goes into this nucleus, which is called the nucleus calorus. And calorus means for heat, calories, obviously. So this is a specialization in the rattlesnake brain to take the information and then notice it crosses to the other side of the brain, here into the optic tectum, and the optic tectum is also getting input from the eye on the opposite side. So individual nerve cells in the rattlesnake's optic tectum get a synaptic input from an eye on the other side of the head and from the trigeminal system for infrared detection, and they both cross over. This is a fundamental principle of most vertebrate nervous systems, crossing of sensory information. Ours is a little different. We don't have a complete crossing, but it's still a fundamental concept. And I'll show you what that means functionally to have the visual input and the infrared input coming into the same part of the brain. So first, let me show you how you do the experiment. This is a drawing of a coiled up happy rattlesnake. This happy rattlesnake has actually been lightly anesthetized here, so it's in a light state of sleep. This is a microelectrode in the brain of the rattlesnake recording the electrical impulses from the brain in response to various stimuli, which might include an infrared stimulus or a visual stimulus on the other side of the body. And this work was done primarily by Peter Hartline, who's one of the foremost authorities on rattlesnake infrared sensing. And what they found is that the rattlesnake cells in its brain will respond very precisely to stimuli along a very small target here. And then the snake will launch a strike in that direction. By the way, I should have added when I showed you the video earlier, the rattlesnake strike is ballistic. It's all coiled to go about a half a body length or so, and then it lets it all go at once. Boom! To the target its brain calculated as to where it was. It's not correcting on the fly. You saw that rattlesnake in the image before. After it missed, it was hoping that it was going to get something like this, but it couldn't change its course of its strike. It's a ballistic strike, like a ballistic missile. Boom. And then it goes to its target, okay? And it's based on the activity, and these are nerve impulses in that area of the optic tectum calculating exactly where the stimulus came from. And then this is what I promised you I'd mentioned earlier about the optic tectum. It's a little complicated, but suffice it to say, what this shows is maps on the optic tectum. So these little numbers, one, two, three, four, refer to places in the pit where the infrared energy is detected, one at one end, four at the other end, and places coming in from the eye as well where the visual stimulus is detected and how they map onto the optic tectum. And you actually have an aligned map. And that, again, is a principle that we know exists in us and many other animals, where you have maps in the brain of sensory space that are aligned with each other. So if you hear a bird in a tree at a certain angle and you see the bird at that same place, you have a lot better chance 
of getting that bird, let's say you're a cat, if you wanted to get the bird. But if there's a disjunction between one sensory modality and the other, it can become confusing and you're not as likely to be accurate. So the rattlesnake's brain has evolved an exquisite system to survive. Let's now look at another critter we're going to talk about today, and this is the electric fish. And let me first say that electric fish come in different flavors, strongly electric fish, as this torpedo, and weakly electric fish. And then there's another type of fish, this is a shark, that are electroreceptive, but they do not generate their own electrical signals. So you have fish that generate electrical signals, like strongly electric fish that shock you, then you have weakly electric fish that generate electric signals, but not enough to shock you. They use it for communication and navigation. And then you have purely electroreceptive fish, including sharks and others. Some of you may be able to see little, little like holes in the snout here. They're called amptilae of Lorenzini. These are little electrosensory apparatus to detect electric currents, like your EKG, like a contraction of your muscle. Like if you're wearing a ring on your finger and you're in salt water, you get what's called a galvanic field, and the current will flow from a dissimilar metal into the salt water. Any of those things at close range, the shark can detect. So the shark doesn't have to smell your blood or hear you thrashing or anything. It can detect the electrical signals in your body. I've often been asked, well, how do you prevent that? Stop your heart beating, quit moving, take off all your metal. You'll probably be okay. All right. So, so, but they're passive electroreceptive fish. Let's talk about the active electric fish. Let's start with the strongly electric fish. The electric eel is the strongest, about a 600 volt discharge generated by an electric eel. This one is what made one of my daughters decide not to be a marine biologist. She always wanted to be one until she stepped on one of these fish at the beach one day, and then she said, that's it, I'm not becoming a marine biologist. And went on to become a lawyer, as it turns out. <laughs> And then this is the electric catfish. This is my favorite of all, the stargazer, Astroscopus. Maybe some of you can see his eyes. This fish has done an amazing thing evolutionarily. It's taken the eye muscles that normally control the movements of our eyes, called extraocular muscles, and it's converted them into electric organs instead of being muscles. So if you're unfortunate enough to swim between this fish's eyes, it generates an electric current right between its eyes by its eye muscles that shocks you and stuns you, and then you can be eaten by that fish. As a matter of fact, I will show you how that works. First, they dig a hole in the sand, hide. Where do you see him get down there? It's great. There he goes, gone. Wait till the dust clears. I don't know if you can see his mouth right along there. Eyes are here. Here we go. Watch out. Somebody's going to swim by soon. Oh, this is a different angle. It's fast. It's really fast. Now he buries himself back in the sand again. I think there's one more here. Oh, no, that was it. So these fish just lie there and wait. As soon as a fish comes over, bingo, they shock them, and then they grab them. The fish is stunned for a few seconds. But I really want to concentrate on the weakly electric fish. Here are some examples. They have very interesting anatomy. They tend to be long or have a long nose, and this helps them to generate these electric fields that they're using. And they use these weakly electric fields primarily for two reasons, two, uh, two outcomes. One, to communicate with other fish, and two, to locate. That is, to find things in their environment. So if they're in murky water and they can't see in front of them, they generate a weakly electric field around their body, they can detect small perturbations in the field, like a rock or another fish, and navigate around them by detecting disturbances in the shape of the electric field. And they do that because they have these little receptors in the skin called electroreceptors. So let's see how they make the electricity first. So the way they do it is they modify cells, as I was saying earlier about the stargazer. So each one of these is a cell called an electroplax. And these cells are little batteries. Imagine each one is about a tenth of a volt. Each cell in your body is roughly a tenth of a volt negative inside with respect to outside. The cells do that by moving charged ions across the membrane and separating charges. If you line them up in series, as shown here, you can get a very strong battery. A bunch of tenth of a volts become volts, and you can generate electric signals when the nerve activates them. This is an actual picture of some of the nerves innervating some of these cells. So some of these fishes, like the weakly electric organ shown here in the fish called gymnotus, have these things all along their body, and they generate these weak electric fields around their body. 
<clears throat> and this just shows an example of the fields they generate. In this case, it's one that goes up and down and up and down, and it actually makes kind of a clicking sound. Electric field on, off, on, off, like that. And it's generating a signal in the water that other fishes would be able to detect. Let's see a quick little movie, and there'll be sound with this. This is uh, from the lab of Carl Hopkins at Cornell, and this is one of these weekly... Over here in this tank. And then I'm going to turn my loudspeaker up so you can hear it. That's the fish generating electric pulses. And so those pulses that you're hearing are the fish using its navigation system, which is based on uh, electrical pulses, to, uh, to move around in the environment. And and each one of those is a pulse that he's recording on the computer. So the fish generates these fields, and if there's something around it, it detects that as a disturbance in the electric field to navigate. Likewise, it can send signals to a partner. And one of the things the fish do that's really impressive is a jamming avoidance response. So one fish is putting out clicks at, say, 10 times per second, pop, 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 like that, and the other fish is doing brrrr. If the other one shifts into his frequency and jams him, he'll shift his frequency away from that. So you can have a lot of fish in the same river around each other generating these fields that communicate, and they can identify their own discharge and avoid getting jammed by a neighbor. So it's a very sophisticated set of tools that their brain has in terms of feedback circuits for compensation to make this effective communication. And then lastly, this is just a picture of one of the sharks. These are these ampullae I talked about earlier on their face. These are the nerves that innervate it and go into the shark's brain. And this is how a shark would detect, for example, a, a swimmer nearby, a swimming fish. But that's the passive electric fish. And then the last thing I want to say about them is their brains are incredibly evolved for this purpose. So these are a couple pictures of electric fish brains. This is a diagram with a lot more detail than you need to know. But I want to make one take home point here. This part of the brain back here is the cerebellum. The cerebellum is the little part, as a matter of fact, it means the little brain. The little part of our brain in the back here that in humans is a very small part. In these fish, it gets elaborated and grows over the whole brain. It's often called a gigantocerebellum. And that gigantocerebellum has lots of neuronal circuits and synapses set up in such a way that it can very precisely detect differences in the electrical signal coming in along the body at different points. So it can, it can detect those disturbances in the field. So this animal developed a very different type of brain than you would see in most other vertebrates that is used to very, uh, do some very sophisticated analysis. And by the way, people wonder about electric fish and how they dream. So there were a series of studies to try to figure out how, how these fish dream. And what they did was go into rivers and place these electrodes to interact and kind of create electrical signals artificially for the fish and disrupt them. And they came to the conclusion that they had bursts of activity when they were resting that the authors concluded were zap dreaming. And so that the electric fish were actually having very short periods of time of contemplation while they were sitting in place. I think that's a bit of an overreach to say they were dreaming, but nonetheless it generates some uh, humor and enthusiasm in the community. And then I just want to talk about one other cool animal called the barn owl. Uh, many of you have probably seen a barn owl. They're quite beautiful. Uh, and one of the things that stands out, I think, about their face right away that you notice is this encirclement around the face. And you don't have to be a biologist to begin to think there's probably something special going on there. And indeed there is. So barn owls, like a lot of other owls, are very good at hunting. This is a picture of a barn owl who's made a catch of a field mouse in the daytime. And by the way, they have these incredible rings, so wings so that they approach almost silently. On the very front leading edge that most airplanes would have a certain design uh, for creating an airfoil over the wing, the barn owls have evolved and developed uh, an orientation of feathers that eliminates all the turbulence on the leading edge. So they come in absolutely dead quiet if you've ever heard one. It's virtually impossible to hear them until they're right on you. So this is not good for the mice, obviously. This series of pictures was taken in a darkened setting of a barn owl sequentially catching a mouse. The reason it's red is they're using near-infrared photography. So in this case, the owl can't see a thing, but the owl will precisely find the prey and grab it. 
almost every time. And that's not because the owl has infrared sensitivity like the rattlesnake. That's because the owl has an incredible sense of hearing and is able to decode and hear sounds, very weak sounds, um, at very precise distances and calculate that and make the same sort of strike, if you will. But this is a compensatory trajectory. This is not ballistic. The owl is compensating the whole time, calculating the information on the fly as to where the mouse is before it makes the attack. And this is just an example of that. And what are, what are shown here is uh, arrival of sounds uh, coming into different ears, the right and the left ear, and how this activity maps into the brain. That is, different areas of the brain that are specialized for detecting these differences in arrival time. And getting back to that part of the owl's face I was talking about, that's where its ears are. They're right in the front. The ears are in that circular area right under the eyes. So that whole ring you saw is a specialized area for trapping the sound and focusing it into the ears in the front of the face. And what the owl is able to do is detect for individual nerve cells the timing delay of the arrival of the sound between one ear and the other ear. So in other words, if the sound is right in front of you, it'll arrive at exactly the same time here and here. If it's a little bit to the right, it'll get here first, here second. A little bit to the left, vice versa. And as it turns out, the height difference can be detected because the owl's ears are actually offset a little bit in the vertical dimension. So the owl will turn its head, focus where it thinks the prey is, collect the information from the prey about identifying what it is and then where it is and continue to make adaptations in its trajectory until it lands. And this is, by the way, the frequency of the sound that the owl is hearing. And this has a signature in it to identify it as a mouse, which the owl recognizes quite well. And uh, here's a picture of what I just said, the slight offset, the right ear flap and the left ear flap. You can see they're a little bit offset vertically here. And they sit in this very nice reflective apparatus around the entire face. So they're very effective hunters. This is a picture of the owl brain. And it has very specialized region as well for detecting and analyzing the location of where the object is. So in every case, these animals have evolved specialized apparatus in their brain and in the peripheral part of the body based on the world they live in and how they can most successfully communicate, hunt, reproduce, all of these things that they need to do in their environment. I'll just skip over that. And so lastly, I just want to say a little bit about humans in this context. So we've talked about infrared detection, we've talked about electroreception, and we've talked about auditory system and hearing and exquisite senses in certain animals. So where do humans fit with all of this? So this is looking at hearing curves and sensitivity. And what is plotted here on the x-axis is the frequency of sound. And this is plotted on a log scale. So this is 10 cycles per second, 100, 1,000, 10,000, and so forth. And then this is showing threshold. So as you go up here, the thresholds are higher. It's measuring in decibels what's called sound pressure level. And so as you go down here, you're more and more sensitive. As the thresholds get higher, it takes more energy to hear the sound. So you can see the human here uh, in the solid color. And we're really good around, you know, sort of three kilohertz up to about eight kilohertz. Human speech is in this area. And then we start to really go south as we get up to higher and higher frequency sounds. And by the way, this changes dramatically with aging. Uh, little kids are quite good across the whole spectrum, up to about 20 kilohertz. By the time you reach my age, not so good in the high frequencies. Just ask anybody who works with me or lives with me if that's true or not. So uh, that's due to a lot of things that happen over time and with age, but there's quite a compression of the hearing scale. And also, um, I think you all know that you know, different animals, uh, like here shows a dog and how they can hear in the higher frequency ranges. And a mouse, look how far they are up here, right here. Uh, and then in the very low frequency sounds, some of the big animals like elephants. By the way, the farther apart your ears are, the better you are at localizing a sound. Because the time delay will be greater getting the impulses in from one side to the other. So if you're, excuse the expression, a blockhead, you're better at localizing sound. If you're a pinhead, it's a little more challenging, basically, OK? But that would have worked for any of us, whether we're humans or any other species. So uh, and, and the last thing I want to say is with all the, the different cool sensory modalities, 
Human beings have a very strong visual input. We rely very much on our visual sense to determine what's going on in the world. A very large part of our brain is involved with visual processing of one type or another. This just shows some maps of where the visual information goes to the back of the brain and then up again in the front, some of these other areas. So we're very, very dependent on that. But the human brain is also very adaptable. In this case, this is from the brain of a person who is blind and the little hot spots show activity when they hear sounds. So indeed, it's been thought for many years that after you lose a sensory modality, you become better at another. But there hasn't been a lot of really good, precise scientific evidence on the subject. There now is a fair amount. And indeed, when you lose one particular sensory modality, you can become much more precise with another sensory modality, such as being blind and using hearing, for example. And it's been shown in the human brain, all kinds of neural circuits can become activated that normally aren't activated for that sensory modality. So the human brain, like all brains, is extremely adaptable to changing circumstances. So I've gone too long, and I'll end there, and I think I'm, I'm gonna, gonna have, have uh, Dr. Van Wert come up, and then at the end, we'll have time for questions for both of us, okay? So thank you very much for your attention, and I'll now introduce Dr. Van Wert.